Hello, guys. Hello. Welcome back again. We continue our Node.js Global Summit. It's 24 hours marathon, uh, and the, we have uh, around five hours ahead. We have a next block with uh, three speakers, uh, which are already ready to uh, present you amazing topics, answer your light and tough questions. By the way, we have all the recordings of the sessions of the today. So because the junior session is free of charge, uh, and those of you who did not purchase uh, junior attendance uh, with uh, video uh, access, you are able to actually get access to the video recordings just for uh, $15 for all the videos that have been recording during today's 24 hours sessions. Uh, actually, we also have a request to you. Uh, we need the people, we need volunteers who is able to make a localization translation into a local language all the video sessions that has happened. So if you would like to participate, if you have community who can also help us in your country, in your region to make a translation, give us a sign in a chat window, any, um, any, any way, any, any channel that you uh, have with us. Um, let us know that you would like to do it. Give us email or um, a link to your LinkedIn page or Facebook, whatever. We need people who will help us to localize, to spread the knowledge that happened during the, uh, the uh, sessions today. So um, we have ready our guest, our true Berliner. Bogdan Nedelku, uh, who is software engineer uh, at Klarna. Uh, hello, Bogdan. Are you with us already? Hi. Can you hear me? Hey. Yeah, you yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yes, amazing. yes. So this is a um, the cool guy with the proven track recording building and actually scaling the software systems across the different industries. Uh, it's interesting that uh, Bogdan graduating in our space engineering and working in academia, to, uh, he took uh, on the CTO role, building software teams at Anima Ventures and BMDG Partners. So today, Bogdan is building the banking experience uh, you love at, at, uh, at Klarna. So besides, he's also teaching the software to the most diverse group of students uh, at the uh, uh, REDI School of Digital Integration. And uh, as I said, he is a true Berliner and he loves very much to wake up early morning. That's why Bogdan is with us. Bogdan, the stage is yours. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. Welcome. Thank you, Andy, for the, for the introduction. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, well, this is going to be a bit tricky. So you should be seeing my, my slides right now. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining. I hope you're hearing me well. Um, thanks a lot for, for joining us from, from every part of the world. I'm in Berlin right now. Uh, it's, it was sunny half an hour ago, uh, not anymore, though. And uh, I woke up early in the morning. And today, uh, I wanted to share a bit uh, what, I, what I've learned in the last uh, couple of, of months, uh, experimenting with, with event-driven systems uh, in Node and GraphQL. So um, event-driven systems are something that uh, it's quite it's coming back, as, as many things do in, in our sector, coming back again after 20 years in the, in, in the shadows, let's say. And, and Node, uh, it's quite the perfect, perfect example of an event-driven system itself. Because at the core of Node, we all know uh, that, it's, uh, that it's an event driven architecture and there's the event stack and so on. And I wanted to play around and understand a bit more about how this would work uh, exactly uh, with the with GraphQL, which is uh, the data data fetching technology that uh, has been around for a while, already five years since Facebook released it. And everybody kind of loves, especially uh, our client developers, they love GraphQL. So I, I made a bit of research in. How would these two things work together to make um, systems even more performant? And so um, the story always starts with well, with the software project, uh, and it always starts with something that we used to call a monolith, uh, which is basically an application that sits, uh, let's say it's somehow isolated, but it basically satisfies more or less all the concerns of our 
of our front end. And the advantages of the monolith are many, and uh, it's it's had quite a bad reputation lately. But uh, there's there's good reasons to start with monoliths. Um, one of them is that the upside costs are minimum, so you can just get started. Uh, it's super easy to share code. It's super easy to share data. Uh, you don't have to worry too much about ownership, authentication, and authorization. All these things are quite easy when you have code um, sharing the same infrastructure. The only problem with monoliths is that uh, as you keep implementing more and more business logic, things start to get really messy really fast. And so you start thinking, uh, well, OK, let's split this. And you start thinking in modules. And maybe you start going for a modular approach to monoliths, which you know comes quite naturally. So you start separating your code by features and say, OK, this is mod module A, module B, module C. But even that starts to, to fail when you realize uh, your, your release cycle keeps being really coupled. So in order to release certain parts of your application, you just have to make uh, these big, big, big releases. And they have a huge risk in terms of there's so many parts of the system that you touch. So you wish things could be somehow more isolated. And at the same time, there's a lot of dependencies uh, team level. Let's say if you're collaborating with a lot of other developers, you'd have to wait. Uh, you'd have to probably share code in some sort of a mono repo fashion, and then agree on code standards, agree on linting, agree on pretty much everything, agree on which type of conversion you use. So everything will be so shared that the, the biggest advantage of the monolith ends up being the biggest disadvantage. And so um, lately, I, I guess around yeah, maybe in the last 10 years, the industry started moving into and talking a lot about microservices. Basically, every second talk uh, at the conference, it's about microservices and how to split and when to split and why do we split a monolith application into these services, uh, which I call Mac micro because they're as small as possible. So basically, we would take the monolith, split it into independent parts that own their own data and then develop them and deploy them independently. And at least this would give us some sort of decoupling. So all of a sudden, we have these individual pieces that uh, live by themselves. We can deploy individually. We can test them individually. Uh, and more importantly, they, they also um, they own their own data. So things uh, all of a sudden, you can have several teams collaborating in parallel. And when it comes to scaling, you can scale your application slightly easier because as opposed to the monolith where you just had to throw more instances to the monolith or have more instances of it, you, you can, in microservices, you can basically analyze which one of your services gets most of the load and then focus your resources there, which makes it slightly more cost efficient and obviously more performant. Now, of course, microservices come with a lot of disadvantages um, also, which we learn to live with. As uh, as you just saw in the previous talk, we we're talking about Kubernetes and Docker and all these solutions. They came around in order to understand a bit more and, and leverage automatization to make microservices manageable. The hard thing about microservices is that communication is over the network, and that makes everything easy, uh, harder. And also that because they own their own data, in order to share data across your service, all of a sudden you have to uh, write all these REST APIs and care about authentication and catching, retry mechanism, latency, so on and so forth. So they come with a lot of baggage. Uh, they are not so straightforward. And the fact that you have the network in between uh, every communication makes things harder. Things like logging becomes a lot harder. You have to uh, be able to trace requests uh, that start at wherever your user does the interaction through several microservices. They touch different data points. And so debugging becomes quite of a, a pain. And then you also have to take care of all the integration and contract testing. So in order to maintain quality, you would have to implement all these not so straightforward uh, ways of, of testing and deploying and maintaining. So you, you need certain expertise. Uh, but also, it does take a lot of effort. And it can become really cumbersome, especially when you pass, you know, let's say 20, 30 microservices. Debugging is just, uh, it's uh, basically like traveling into, into a galaxy, right? You go from one microservice to another without knowing uh, really well where, where you're going to end up to, in order to reproduce your transactions.
And so the latest, uh, I think in, for, for the last two years, um, the industry came up with, uh, with events. Uh, and so the idea is um, we are able to choreograph uh, our architecture using events rather than the orchestration model in microservices. So instead of having a central, central unit that coordinates the different moving pieces, we just design these pieces as individual actors that do not really care about the time and the space of where they are. You just uh, choose to subscribe to a stream of events, uh, a stream of facts. So events are sort of things that happen, a fact, something that happened in the, in the timeline. And then they choose to react to it by either doing some sort of operation, sending an email, persisting something to their own database, running some business logic. And then ideally, once they are done, let's say with something, they would emit another event uh, into an event stream that another microservice can listen to. And so with this approach, uh, we managed to be completely decoupled, uh, decoupled from the other services. And we managed to have this plug and play uh, behavior where we could at any point take a new service and put it in our in our architecture. And that's great, uh, but it also brings new paddings to how we program and how we build our applications, both in the back end and front end. And what I've been looking into lately is how could we actually leverage the fact that Node, it's also built around events, uh, in order to build some sort of a full stack, real time application that can manage performance in the way we, we expect. So, um, the most important thing about event-driven design, and I'm not going to, to dive too deep into here, I think it's a super interesting topic, so feel free to, to dive into it, is that event-driven designs are focused on the system behavior rather than structures. So instead of looking towards what is the, the structure of the system and how it would look like, we look more at what, what happens, how does the system react to it, and what are the interactions that need to happen there. But we don't care that much about how things are in place. We just expect that we, we shouldn't, uh, ideally shouldn't care about our surroundings. And we want our services to be able to just react in isolation and deliver on the business uh, structure in isolation. It's a bit kind of a metric structure of completely independent actors that listen and react to, to facts. And the cool thing about this is that you all, all of a sudden the time dimension disappears. So you could plug in, let's say an analytics microservice six months after you build your whole system and it will still pick up everything that happened in the past, let's say, reproduce that with the events and start from there. So it makes it extremely easy to have plug and play uh, behaviors. Uh, I know one of the things we probably hear all the time is that Node.js is an event-driven HTTPS server. Uh, and this comes from back, uh, not even from Node, but back from uh, JavaScript that was designed for the browser. And JavaScript was built naturally around events. The events were user, um, mostly made by users. So you probably remember the, the own event, their own click, their own form, all these things that the document object model, the DOM, would send to the, to the browser. And then JavaScript, it's able to attach callbacks to that. And once a certain event would happen, JavaScript will react by uh, putting the certain the, the callback related to that event in the event stack. Uh, the good, cool thing cool thing about this is that you could actually react to uh, really fast to many different uh, user interactions and um, uh, run certain business logic like you know validating forms, showing your pop up. All these things are quite low weight in in the, the work they do on the CPU. And so this, this worked really well in order to have a kind of non-blocking interaction uh, of the user with the browser. That was all, uh, all designed that way. And when, when something would happen, then JavaScript in the browser would need more work, then uh, worker threats, worker, workers in the browser came along. But Node, uh, when, when it was built in 2009, it basically picked up all this. It picked up the event-driven uh, philosophy of JavaScript and then just took it and made it as a first class in the server context. And so the idea was we're going to build a, an HTTP server just the way JavaScript was built and make events as a first class citizen in the HTTP server. Um, 
And so this was the big promise of Node that you were able to scale. Uh, but how, how exactly would that happen? Um, well, in order to scale, we, we do know that we, we, we ideally want to scale in a way that's still performant. Uh, and so we want our applications to be to have low latency even when uh, the throughput is higher. We want to be uh, cost effective because otherwise, well, the business is just not sustainable. And we need to be somehow reliable and face safe, which is extremely hard, but we still want to try to mitigate at least and have a try mechanism uh, if anything goes wrong. Uh, and so going back to how JavaScript was built, because uh, Node inherits uh, the JavaScript philosophy when it comes to the language, Node also performs extremely well when the amount of the CPU work that we do per request, it's relatively uh, small. And so if uh, we're talking about servers where you have a lot of traffic, but the request and response, it's, uh, the, the response to that traffic, it's something that you don't need extremely CPU work with. Let's say you make a simple uh, DB request or there's just certain logic or you process certain input and give it back in, in a different shape, then you can node scales extremely, extremely well and much better than, than most of the servers. And the reason is uh, node is able to uh, use the event loop uh, in order to have these concurrent, many concurrent requests and satisfy them all um, in, a, in a decent time, which is something that back in 2009 was quite quite new and uh, web servers like PHP were not capable of doing. And so when you had a lot of concurrent users, Node would, would outbid competition extremely well. And that's why Node actually picked up. Um, now, one of the ways to go even farther, let's say we, we want even more traffic on our machine, is to scale horizontally. So we would take our Node service, uh, and then usually it comes out of the box with different cloud providers, but some have some sort of an auto scaling mechanism. And say, instead of running one instance, we will run uh, 5, 10, 15, whatever it is, proportional to the throughput uh, we actually need. So this is all great, um, but you have we have to still be careful because um, running more instances of an app that's not well designed, it's not going to solve us any problem. And I had experience in the past where uh, if, a, if an application even built with Node.js, it's built in a way that's memory intensive or if the algorithms that's using are not, um, they, they use way too much CPU or they're not optimized, it doesn't really matter if you're just gonna throw more instances because you have to understand really well what's the cost of the request you're making and then try to estimate uh, how much that will take. And throwing more instances, usually it just duplicates or it also comes with a huge cost. Not, all, not only of, um, you know, people always talk about compute cost that, oh, it's, it's much harder to run my system, but it also comes uh, at, a, at the cost of um, extra orchestration. So all of a sudden, if you're running many instances of the same application, you have to somehow also find a way to scale your database uh, and scale all the dependencies that come with it. Deployment takes a lot longer. And uh, there's all, as, as the system gets bigger, obviously the points of failure are are more spread out. So everything becomes harder. Logging, it's a bit harder. There's, there's latency there. And so ideally, you want, even if we have the possibility of scaling our app horizontally, we still want to invest as much time as we can in building an application that is ready to scale without necessarily consuming more resources. And so the other option is to scale the application vertically, which basically means uh, whatever machines we are running onto, we will just uh, make them, uh, give them more resources. Uh, this also works, but the, the software has also to be prepared for it. So if we're gonna give more CPU or more memory to our, to our instances, we have to be really careful and understand that, uh, first of all, this type of scaling is not super elastic. You wouldn't need to shut down your servers to, to rescale. Um, and the, if the software running on it, it's not ready for it. The improvements that you will see are not uh, proportional to the cost. So it will again start being really costly uh, without seeing uh, big improvements unless the application is prepared to take advantage of the underlying uh, hardware. 
Uh, and so the question appears, uh, which is, well, what about just building apps that leverage the hardware more? So um, we could actually build our applications in a way that um, we take a lot more advantage of the hardware underneath if we understand the fundamentals behind it. Um, so this is the idea that kind of came uh, into my mind a bunch of months ago when I was struggling with, uh, with the non-performant apps, especially uh, when it came to CPU intensive tasks, like we're trying to generate a PDF or we're trying to do certain permutation functions. A node was really struggling with these things. And we actually seen it, it was, it got to a point where it wasn't sustainable anymore. So we really have to make a full stop and understand how you could go around the fact that node is still a single threaded uh, and is designed uh, the way, the way the event loop is designed in, in node, it makes it really nicely to compute uh, high frequency. It's really good for high frequency, but not for high intensity uh, processes. And so, as I said before, because Node inherits the event loop model, um, we are really successful in the same way JavaScript was successful in the browser, we are successful in the backend. But there are, set, there, there are times when, because of the asymmetry, we have microservices that we still write in Node because we love the language and we really used to write the language and we love TypeScript. But uh, those microservices have to do certain work that it's more CPU intensive. And so we need to rethink uh, what, what we're doing in order to keep making Node a viable option for, for, for these services. And so uh, if you uh, probably have been paying attention to the latest Node release and see that everybody's uh, fizzing about the worker threads and uh, that there is so much, so much better way to parallelize work and rely on our CPUs. And that's, uh, that's what kind of got my attention in, in the latest release. And I said, well, um, we have this event-driven padding. We have Node, makes it a good choice. If we could actually work around Node limitation that uh, it's not suited for CPU-intensive tasks by using some of something based on worker threads, then Node would be just the perfect choice for building backend systems. And that would be just awesome for, for all the Node developers. So you also probably have seen uh, this image where we kind of try to uh, understand a bit what do we mean by worker threads at a high level. Um, basically, Node gives you the opportunity uh, to use the main, the main thread to spawn uh, subsequent addition threads and offload work to, to those threads. Uh, many of you would ask, uh, well, how is this different from a, pro a child process? Or how is this different from PM2, which was just mentioned uh, in the talk before? So I, we could do all this with, with PM2 or just uh, using uh, the process process API from, from now. But the biggest difference with worker threads is that they are slightly uh, more performant than uh, using child processes. And even more important, they share memory. So the subsequent threads that we spawn share memory with the main thread, which means we can parallelize work to a level that we're just not able to do with child threads. Uh, because uh, child processes uh, usually communicate, we communicate with them through JSON objects, and that's quite limited. If we could just share memory somehow, then we could parallelize work much easier and also implementation would be, uh, it's, it's slightly easier to implement and slightly more straightforward. You don't need to be too, too advanced or to invest too much time in understanding how this parallelization work and then standardizing your data structures so they actually match um, the JSON structure that we expect. And so uh, that's what more or less workers do. I, I, again, didn't want to dive too much deep into it. What I want, it's what I wanted is on, on, on the quest to kind of understand how would this work in a real time application. So, okay, we are able to, to use worker threads, but first of all, can we use worker threads for everything? That's probably the second question you would ask. Well, you know, well, what if we can just make Node always more performant, not only when we need it, uh, by using worker threads? And the answer to that question is pretty straightforward. Even if uh, we can offload work to uh, to the worker threads, they're quite expensive to spawn. So it's still 
uh, you still have to analyze when does it for which kind of operation do you want to use them and to be to be honest uh, for operations like input output the node apis are still the best choice because they are, they are much more optimized than spawning a new worker and closing that worker and so you want to use workers uh, in situations that are less frequent but they can turn into a blocking task for for your server and so uh, we took a look at the, at the event-driven uh, side of things. Uh, we understand that node it's event-driven, and we could actually and, and it fits really well with uh, an event-driven system outside because you could easily use node internal APIs like the event emitter and the fact that the response and the request are actually streams. You could use all that to uh, integrate natively with your with your uh, system. And so if, if you're building your, your system around events and you're using an event-based HTTP server, the integration is much, much easier. But that's all on the server side. So the biggest question comes uh, when we talk about the front end and say, well, OK, what, what would happen in the, in the client? So especially uh, if, we, if we have this event-driven architecture, what, what would actually happen uh, on the client side of things? And that's uh, when I started thinking about GraphQL. Um, you probably already also heard about it. It's uh, one of the, I think one of the game changer technologies in the last years was GraphQL. Uh, it's an alternative for REST and actually is becoming the replacement for REST. Uh, and what GraphQL in simple words gives us, it's the ability to have a data layer for our application where all our types and business domain is standardized. And that's extremely cool because um, you can develop clients so much easier. You don't have to document a lot. You can use uh, the best. The, the tooling is just amazing. And so pretty much all the front end uh, uh, developers, front end engineers that I've been working with, they are just amazed by GraphQL. And so when you come up with the idea of having this cool worker threads and event even in the back end, you have to consider, well, you know, can I actually, can I actually still reap the benefits of this uh, great tooling and the data layer and still have a, a event-driven backend with uh, you know super optimized node machines in the in the backend. Can I can I can would this work? How would this work? And so this is how um, the 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 research kind of my research kind of tied it. Um, and immediately I fall back to uh, thinking about uh, the graphical subscriptions. So we all know that GraphQL has, has queries where you would just you know, get query data, just as you do in, in REST, only you would get it as JSON. Uh, and then there's the GraphQL mutations where you could persist data. Uh, there's a bunch of directives more. But there's also this thing called subscriptions. And subscriptions are a way that GraphQL gives to be able to have the, the WebSockets behavior that we used to, but now in GraphQL. And so um, it would allow the server to open a channeling message with a client, and then they could both uh, listen and send messages in real time to each other. So the way uh, a super simplified way subscription work is basically we would have the client app, let's say React application, um, that would parse and validate the subscription query, and then it will begin listening to using the, the GraphQL um, schema and resolver, there's kind of a subscribe fields there. And it will begin listening and subscribe to the event backend. Um, our event backend, let's say it's written in node, it will do certain logic and then emit an event like, hey, this is finished, or I'm still working on this. And then GraphQL could actually take that, uh, type it really cool, and send it to the front end in a way uh, they actually prefer and they understand. And so the whole idea looked really cool. Like, okay, we could actually give user feedback. So we could optimize our node machines to be super performant, but also we could use subscriptions and plug them in and then have like instant user feedback of what's actually happening in the backend, which is extremely hard uh, if you don't use this kind of stack. So you'd have to think about WebSockets yourself. You'd have to standardize somehow, or you'd have to have um, WebSockets and REST at the same time, co-living. Uh, and so this is just uh, an amazing way to, to just uh, take out a lot of work for developers and make it uh, extremely easy for the user to understand what's, what's going in the backend. So 
after kind of reading out and then talking a lot about all this theory, I decided to take this for a ride and see uh, how this actually would work in the real world, right? Because yeah, theory it's nice, but uh, practice is where most things, uh, yeah, where, where you actually learn the most. And so uh, I've been playing around with it. I tried to uh, basically set it up um, uh, two systems because I wanted to compare and actually I wanted to have the real time feedback of, okay, this task is actually being processed by my backend, but also to understand um, how uh, to, to give the user kind of a checkpoint progress bar view of what's happening. So you could actually see, oh, okay, this server actually has work address, this one doesn't. And this is how this one server uh, separates my, breaks down my computation into tasks. And uh, this is how much faster is it. So that was the, the initial idea I had. Uh, and then I used a uh, yeah, simple pub and sub system uh, because I wanted to be emitting events back and forth and then have a GraphQL server basically uh, listening to those events and uh, offering them to a client to subscribe. Um, the stack I use for the client is React.js because basically the, the integration is instantaneous with GraphQL. Uh, I used Apollo as a client, which uh, it, it basically took less, less than zero time to have uh, the WebSocket set up with the GraphQL layer and the schema and the layer for debug in seconds. Right? The hard part here was to actually understand how the web workers work, especially when you're running these things on the same machine. And so I have a small demo for you. OK, now, um, so uh, this is quite simple. This is a front-end front -end development done by somebody that does a lot of backend, as you can see. Uh, but uh, basically, I will send a number of tasks that you can see here to the backend. Uh, and basically, that's, that's six. Uh, I'm basically telling the backend, do something really expensive six times. And it will pick it up and then start running it either in parallel or in a single thread model. Uh, and then we are supposed to see real-time feedback. And this all happens through GraphQL and React. Uh, in the backend, uh, I have on my machine right now running two, uh, a Docker Compose, a Docker Swarm, with two Docker containers. One of them has the parallel node implementation of the same function, and one of them has just a single one, basically the same code. Uh, yes. Only one of them is using the four cores on my machine, and the other one is using a single core. So let's hope this works. Yeah, there you go. So basically, we created the six tasks and send them to the backend. And if everything works well, uh, so this was super flaky um, because uh, worker threads are not super straightforward. You see already the parallel, uh, the parallel server already finished and it completed everything in kind of a synchronous fashion. And what you're going to see with a single um, with a single server, it just it kind of goes through all of them. It takes a lot longer to complete, and uh, it. it just uh, completes everything asynchronously, and there's not a lot of feedback to the user of, of what's actually happening. Um, so yeah, that was pretty much how far I got so far. Um, oh, OK, I should have. This was my, my demo backup, um, because we're doing this remote, and you never know. Uh, and so there's a lot, as you've seen, there's a lot of future work. So my first, uh, the first remark that you probably ask yourself if you're watching this, I do not see the comments right now. But I'm, I'm guessing that's happening. It's uh, how would this work in the cloud? Um, as you've seen, when I triggered the mutation, uh, the both work, uh, both processes didn't start it at the same time. And the reason is because we are running on Docker. And so once once we we manage uh, multi-threading in Node, now we are in the Docker layer where it turns out Docker also makes some sort of uh, has has the sort of uh, event stack itself, and it basically prioritizes the parallel uh, server work over the other, the, the single work. So I would like to deploy this to the cloud and actually have like real-time feedback on much more intensive tasks to the user and also try to um, try it out with different different tasks. So right now I was just doing some maths. I took some uh, sinus tangent functions that are quite expensive and ran them over a, an array that's, uh, uh, I don't know, it has a length of 1 billion. Uh, I would like to, to take it to the cloud and try maybe some decrypt functions. The next thing I want to do is to add performance hooks and set up uh, like a 
full grade profiling to really understand what is the proportion of uh, machine uh, of cores that the machine have and the amount of work that I'm actually slacking off. Because uh, what I've realized is that even if I was running the tasks on, on a four core versus a one core, um, the worker threads were still not giving me the, the performance uh, advantage I would expect. So I would like to get that coefficient there to see if I had eight cores, what's going to be my, my, my coefficient of, am I eight times faster? And I, I slightly doubt. So I actually think if you had four cores, you are somehow twice faster. And if you had eight, maybe you are 3.5 times faster. But it's definitely, you're not, you're not getting um, up your game with, with every uh, core you add. Uh, and so summing up, uh, what I learned is that Node, it's a perfect uh, fit for event driven because they integrate naturally. And so we can, emit, uh, we can uh, subscribe and we can emit event streams directly from Node. We can easily integrate it full stack with GraphQL. So we can just plug it in. Uh, and then when things get stuck, when things get are still hide, we could go and leverage worker threads, which are also based on events, uh, to improve even further the performance of our, of our system. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm really sure there's, there's a bunch of use cases that want to apply this uh, in production where we've been struggling a lot. And uh, usually the normal answer was, well, we're just going to dump Node uh, and do Java or Go. But I really think uh, that with this investment and with this stack, you can actually go much faster and implement much faster your features and still leverage on, on Node as, as being uh, performant. And yeah, this is it uh, from my side. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm going to publish the code on GitHub. And if you have any other questions, just feel free to reach out to me. Uh, that's my, uh, this, you can find me on, on LinkedIn or devs too. And uh, please reach out. And uh, yeah, we can, we can chat about it. Thank you. Uh, if you can uh, put your uh, LinkedIn uh, link to the chat window would be cool because really the goal is to, is to connect developers across the world with each other. So don't hesitate, give a link. You have a lot of professional friends uh, just in a few moments. Um, <laughs> that sounds really good, Andy. <laughs> yeah. Bogdan, tell me, please, uh, how it is feeling at talking about technical stuff in the morning about Node and... Uh... <laughs> in the morning? Wow. wow. Yeah. Uh, I had a lot of coffee. Uh, and uh, I think it's a good, it's a good uh, way to start your morning. I feel energized now. Now I feel like I could do anything. <laughs> Too bad that I, I can only do this on Sundays. <laughs> Oh, I got it. Okay, we will invite you next time again. On <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Great, guys. Uh, if you have any questions to Bogdan, uh, don't hesitate to give uh, the Q to the Q and A panel uh, because we're gonna have a Q and A session at the end, so you can put uh, the questions now, or, or you can keep your questions with you and put them uh, just in um, a little bit more than an hour and a half when we're gonna have. Uh, Q&A session with three speakers uh, in a row. Uh, so thank you, Bogdan. Uh, once again, we are going to hear you pretty soon. So uh, stay with us, but grab some coffee because I understand <laughs> it's early morning in, in Berlin. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Andy. Yeah, great, great presentation, Bogdan. Thank you. Thank you.